Hope you all had a nice evening. And did all of you follow my instructions during the overnight recess? Yes. Is anyone aware of any violations of any of my instructions? No. Very well. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have been selected and sworn as the jury to try the case of the state of Florida versus William Theodore Woodward. Case number 2012-CF-55504A. This is a criminal case. Mr. Woodward is charged with count one, first degree premeditated murder with a firearm, count two, first degree premeditated murder with a firearm, count three, attempted first degree premeditated murder while inflicting great bodily harm with a firearm. The definition of those crimes charged will be explained to you later. The state's charging document, which is called an indictment, is not evidence and is not to be considered by you as any proof of guilt. It is the judge's responsibility to explain the law to you. It is your solemn responsibility to determine if the state proved its accusation beyond a reasonable doubt against Mr. Woodward in accordance with the law that I provide to you. Thus, the province of the jury and the province of the court are well defined and they do not overlap. This is one of the fundamental principles of our system of justice. Before proceeding further, it will be helpful if you understand how a trial is conducted. At the beginning of the trial, the attorneys will have an opportunity, if they wish, to make an opening statement. The opening statement gives the attorneys a chance to tell you what evidence they believe will be presented during the trial. What the lawyers say is not evidence, and you are not to consider it as such. Following the opening statements, witnesses will be called to testify under oath. They will be examined and cross-examined by the attorneys. Documents and other exhibits also may be produced as evidence. After the evidence has been presented, the attorneys will have the opportunity to make their closing arguments. Following the closing arguments by the attorneys, the court will instruct you on the law applicable to the case. After the final instructions are given, you will then retire to consider your verdict. You should not form any definite or fixed opinion on the merits of the case until you have heard all the evidence, the argument of the lawyers, and the instructions on the law by the judge. Until that time, you should not discuss the case among yourselves, even while in the jury deliberation room. You cannot discuss this case until I instruct you to do so. Your verdict must be based solely on the evidence or lack of evidence and the law. I now instruct you not to communicate with anyone, including your fellow jurors, about this case. No communication includes no emailing, text messaging, tweeting, blogging, or any other form of communication. You cannot do any research about the case or look up any information about the case. If you become aware of any violation of any of these rules at all, notify court personnel of the violation. During the course of the trial, the court may take recesses and you will be permitted to separate and go about your personal affairs. During these recesses, you must not discuss the case with anyone nor permit anyone to say anything to you or in your presence about the case. If anyone attempts to say anything to you or in your presence about this case, tell him or her that you are on the jury trying the case and ask that person to stop. If he or she persists, leave that person at once and immediately report the matter to the court deputy who will advise me. All cell phones, computers, tablets, or other types of electronic devices must be turned off while you are in the courtroom. Turned off means that the phone or other electronic device is actually off and not in a silent or vibrating mode. You may use these devices during recesses, but even then you may not use your cell phone or electronic device to find out any information about the case or communicate with anyone about the case or the people involved in the case. Do not take photographs, video recordings, or audio recordings of the proceedings or of your fellow jurors. After each recess, please double check to make sure your cell phone or electronic device is turned off. At the end of the case, while you are deliberating, you must not communicate with anyone outside the jury's, excuse me, you, you must not communicate with anyone outside the jury room. 
You cannot have in the jury room any cell phones, computers, or other electronic devices. If someone needs to contact you in an emergency, the court can receive messages and deliver them to you without delay. A contact phone number will be provided to you if requested. The case must be tried by you only on the evidence presented during the trial in your presence and in the presence of the defendant, the attorneys, and the judge. Jurors must not conduct any investigation of their own. This includes reading newspapers, watching television, or using a computer, cell phone, the internet, any electronic device, or any other means at all to get information related to this case or the people and places involved in this case. This applies whether you are in the courthouse, at home, or anywhere else. You must not visit places mentioned in the trial or use the internet to look at maps or pictures to see any place discussed during the trial. Jurors must not have discussions of any sort with friends or family members about the case or the people and places involved. So do not let even the closest family members make comments to you or ask questions about the trial. In this age of electronic communication, I want to stress again that just as you must not talk about this case face to face, you must not talk about this case by using an electronic device. You must not use phones, computers, or other electronic devices to communicate. Do not send or accept any messages related to this case or your jury service. Do not discuss this case or ask for advice by any means at all, including posting information on an internet website, chat room, or blog. What are the reasons for these rules? These rules are imposed because jurors must decide the case without distraction and only on the evidence presented in the courtroom. If you investigate, research, or make inquiries on your own, the trial judge has no way to make sure that the information you obtain is proper for the case. The parties likewise have no opportunity to dispute or challenge the accuracy of what you find. That is contrary to our judicial system which assures every party the right to ask questions about and challenge the evidence being considered against it and to present argument with respect to that evidence. Any independent investigation by a juror unfairly and improperly prevents the parties from having that opportunity our judicial system promises. Any juror who violates these restrictions jeopardizes the fairness of these proceedings any mistrial could result that would require the entire trial process to start over. A mistrial is a tremendous expense and inconvenience to the parties, the court, and the taxpayers. If you violate these rules, you may be held in contempt of court and face sanctions such as serving time in jail, paying a fine, or both. In every criminal proceeding, a defendant has the absolute right to remain silent. At no time is it the duty of a defendant to prove his or her innocence. From the exercise of a defendant's right to remain silent, a jury is not permitted to draw any inference of guilt, and the fact that a defendant did not take the witness stand must not influence your verdict in any manner whatsoever. The attorneys are trained in the rules of evidence and trial procedure, and it is their duty to make all objections they feel are proper. When an objection is made, you should not speculate on the reason why it is made. Likewise, when an objection is sustained or upheld by me, you must not speculate on what might have occurred had the objection not been sustained, nor what a witness might have said had he or she been permitted to answer. During the trial, it may be necessary to confer with the attorneys out of your hearing to discuss matters that require consideration by me alone. It is impossible to predict when such a conference may be required or how long it will last. When such conferences occur, they will be conducted so as to consume as little of your time as is necessary for a fair and orderly trial of this case. Also, let me advise you that if you pass one of the attorneys outside of the courtroom and the attorney doesn't say hello to you or acknowledge you, please don't think that the attorney is being rude or disrespectful. I have instructed all of the attorneys to have no contact with any juror during this trial. Thank you for your understanding. If you would like to take notes during the trial, you may do so. On the other hand, of course, you are not required to take notes if you do not want to. That will be left up to you individually. 
You have been provided with a notepad, a notebook, and a pen for your use if you wish to take notes. Any notes that you will take will be for your personal use. However, you should not take them with you from the courtroom. During recesses, the court deputy will take possession of your notes and will return them to you when we reconvene. After you have completed your deliberations, the court deputy will deliver your notes to me. They will be destroyed. No one will ever read your notes. If you do take notes, do not get so involved in note-taking that you become distracted from the proceedings. Your notes should be used only as aids to your memory. Whether or not you take notes, you should rely on your memory of the evidence and you should not be unduly influenced by the notes of other jurors. Notes are not entitled to any greater weight than each juror's memory of the evidence. During a trial, I may also be taking notes. If I begin to write notes, that is not a signal to you that what is being said is important or more important than the other evidence you are hearing. Because our tasks are quite different, what I am listening for is different from what you are listening for. Do not conclude from anything I do during the trial that some parts of the trial are more important and some are not. You should listen to all of the evidence then, after you have heard all of the evidence, you should decide as best you can what evidence was important and what was not. I can anticipate some of the law that applies to this case and give it to you at the beginning of the trial so that you will better understand what to be looking for while the evidence is presented. If I later decide that different and or additional law applies to the case, I will tell you. In any event, at the end of the evidence, I will give you the final instructions on which you must base your verdict. At that time, you will have a complete written set of the instructions so you do not have to memorize what I am about to tell you. The defendant has entered a plea of not guilty. This means you must presume or believe the defendant is innocent. This presumption stays with the defendant as to each material allegation in the indictment through each stage of the trial unless it has been overcome by the evidence to the exclusion of and beyond a reasonable doubt. To overcome the defendant's presumption of innocence, the state has the burden of proving the crime with which the defendant is charged was committed, and the defendant is the person who committed the crime. The defendant is not required to present evidence or prove anything. Whenever the words reasonable doubt are used, you must consider the following. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible doubt, a speculative, imaginary, or forced doubt. Such a doubt must not influence you to return a verdict of not guilty if you have an abiding conviction of guilt. On the other hand, if after carefully considering, comparing, and weighing all the evidence, there is not an abiding conviction of guilt, or if having a conviction, it is one which is not stable, but one which wavers and vacillates, then the charge is not proved beyond every reasonable doubt, and you must find the defendant not guilty because the doubt is reasonable. It is to the evidence introduced in this trial and to it alone that you are to look for that proof. A reasonable doubt as to the guilt of the defendant may arise from the evidence, conflict in the evidence, or the lack of evidence. If you have a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant not guilty. If you have no reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant guilty. The state must prove that the crime was committed on or within 24 hours either side of September 3rd, 2012 in Brevard County, Florida. It is up to you to decide what evidence is reliable. You should use your common sense in deciding which is the best evidence and which evidence should not be relied upon in considering your verdict. You may find some of the evidence not reliable or less reliable than other evidence. You should consider how the witnesses act as well as what they say. Some things you should consider are number one, did the witness seem to have an opportunity to see and know the things about which the witness testified? Number two, did the witness seem to have an accurate memory? Number three, was the witness honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? Number four, did the witness have some interest in how the case should be decided? Number five, does the witness's testimony agree with the other testimony and other evidence in the case? 
Whether the state has met its burden of proof does not depend upon the number of witnesses it has called or upon the number of exhibits it has offered, but instead upon the nature and quality of the evidence they present. The fact that a witness is employed in law enforcement does not mean that his or her testimony deserves more or less consideration than that of any other witness. Expert witnesses are like other witnesses with one exception. The law permits an expert witness to give his or her opinion. However, an expert's opinion is reliable only when given on a subject about which you believe him or her to be an expert. Like other witnesses, you may believe or disbelieve all or any part of an expert's testimony. You may hear the testimony of a child. No witness is disqualified just because of age. There is no precise age that determines whether a witness may testify. The critical consideration is not the witness's age, but whether the witness understands the difference between what is true and what is not true, and understands the duty to tell the truth. It is entirely proper for a lawyer to talk to a witness about what testimony the witness would give if called to the courtroom. The witness should not be discredited by talking to a lawyer about his or her testimony. You may rely upon your own conclusion about the credibility of any witness. A juror may believe or disbelieve all or any part of the evidence for the testimony of any witness. A statement claimed to have been made by the defendant outside of court may be placed before you. Such a statement should always be considered with caution and be weighed with great care to make certain it was freely and voluntarily made. Therefore, you must determine from the evidence that the defendant's alleged statement was knowingly, voluntarily, and freely made. In making this determination, you should consider the total circumstances, including, but not limited to, number one, whether when the defendant made the statement, he had been threatened in order to get him to make it, and number two, whether anyone had promised him anything in order to get him to make it. If you conclude the defendant's out-of-court statement was not freely and voluntarily made, you should disregard it. A separate crime is charged in each count of the indictment, and although they are being tried together, each crime and the evidence applicable to it must be considered separately and a separate verdict returned as to each. A finding of guilty or not guilty as to one crime must not affect your verdict as to the other crimes charged. At this time, the attorneys for the parties will have an opportunity to make opening statements in which they may explain to you the issues in the case and summarize the facts that they expect the evidence will show. After all the evidence has been received, the attorneys will again have an opportunity to address you and to make their final arguments. The statements that the attorneys now make and the arguments that they later make are not to be considered by you either as evidence in the case or as your instruction on the law. Nevertheless, these statements and arguments are intended to help you properly understand the issues, the evidence, and applicable law, and so you should give them your close attention. <laughs> 